Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sabir, and I run events here at The Strand. Before we launch into a discussion of Craig Unger's newest title, American Compromat, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on Fourth Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until, after 94 years, The Strand is a sole survivor now run by third generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers, we wouldn't be here today and we are so appreciative of it. So tonight we are thrilled to have with us Craig Unger and Yuri Schwetz for the launch of Craig's newest book, American Compromat. Craig Unger is the author of six books, including the New York Times bestsellers, House of Trump, House of Putin, and House of Bush, House of Zod. For 15 years, he was a contributing editor for Vanity Fair, where he covered national security, the Middle East, and other political issues. A frequent analyst on MSNBC and other broadcast outlets, he was a longtime staffer at New York Magazine, has served as editor-in-chief of Boston Magazine, and has contributed to Esquire, The New Yorker, and many other publications. Unger has written about the Trump-Russia scandal for the New Republic, Vanity Fair, and the Washington Post. He's a graduate of Harvard University and lives in Brooklyn, New York. Yuri Schwetz was a major in the KGB during the years 1980 through 1990. From April 1985 to 1987, he worked in the DC Residentura, the PGU, KGB, SSSR. Schwetz has long been a vocal critic of Vladimir Putin, with whom he was a college mate at the Academy of the KGB Foreign Intelligence. Since 1998, Schwetz has been doing private business security investigations in the former Soviet Union for American and British businesses, including major banks, hedge funds, world top airspace, and international oil companies. In 2020, he consulted with the Committee on Banking and Financial Services at the United States House of Representatives on Russian intelligence activities and money laundering in the U.S. In 1995, he published Washington Station, My Life as a KGB Spy in America. Joining Craig and Yuri in conversation is Scott Horton. Scott is a human rights advocate best known for his representation of Russian physicist and Nobel laureate Andrei Sakharov, as well as other figures in the Russian democracy and human rights movement. He is also a lecturer at Columbia University Law School and a contributing editor at Harper's Magazine, where he writes on legal and national security affairs. He has authored several books, including The Lords of Secrecy, The National Security Elite, and America's Stealth Warfare and Private Security Contractors at War, a study of the modern use of mercenaries. He is also a member of the board of the National Institute of Military Justice, the Andrei Sakharov Foundation, and the American branch of the International Law Association. And so, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Craig, Scott, and Yuri to the stage. Brand has, as a bookstore, as a unique position. Uh, in New York and in the United States, it's just uh, uh, it's miles and miles of books um, are something that captivated me when I first came to New York in 1980. Um, and I can't even begin to toll the number of hours I've spent meandering them and buying far more books than uh, than I than any um, intelligent person would ever buy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I've benefited from it a lot over the years and I'm uh, Really delighted to see the Strand as a survivor, and also really pleased to see it expand into uh, into this area. So, uh, without any more, I'd like to go straight into the book. We have um, uh, Craig Unger, noted uh, author, uh, and we have um, a key uh, subject of the book as well, a, a person whose interviews uh, go uh, right to the heart of it. Um, and I think I'd just like to to launch right off. Um, uh, with a question that is perhaps teed up 
by one of the recent uh, reviews of the book, the one written by John Seifer and published in the uh, Washington Post uh, about a week ago, um, in which he has, I, I, as best I can see, really nothing critical or no questions uh, to raise about uh, about any of the accounts that are furnished in the book. More to the contrary, he sees them all as almost obvious things um, with, a, with a few uh, which are very uh, cleverly uh, presented and arrayed. But I think he, he, at the end, raises this issue of you've given us a, um, an excellent compilation of what has been reported previously uh, on these subjects. But um, what here is new? What, what is something that really justifies the purchase of a new book? So, Craig, that, that one's for you. Right. Well, uh, it's interesting that John Seifer, who, of course, was a longtime former CIA agent, should, should ask that question. Because what's new is this is the first detailed narrative of how the KGB cultivated Donald Trump. And when you look over all the incidents I report, it's true. Many of them have been mentioned before. But that key fact has been omitted again and again and again. And the, the narrative starts mostly in 1980, when you see Trump buying hundreds of TV sets from an uh, electronics store owned by Soviet emigres. That much has been reported before. What's new is that the owner was, according to Yuri, uh, a so-called uh, spotter agent for the KGB. And in selling those TV sets, he was sort of opening the door to potentially recruit Donald Trump as an asset for the KGB. And that kind of thing goes through the entire narrative. You see, again, when, when Trump is being invited uh, to what is then the Soviet Union, to Moscow, uh, that's been reported before. What hasn't been reported is how the people who are doing that are tied to the KGB, that one of them worked uh, in the United Nations Library, that that was a place uh, where uh, the KGB uh, reserved special spots for KGB agents, um, that when they got there, when, when Trump finally got to the Soviet Union, uh, he was being force-fed. Again, this is through Yuri, and I, I've been able to corroborate a lot of this through other sources. But he was being force-fed talking points that were published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Boston Globe. And they sort of inflated Trump's ego and made him in, think he was, I mean, this is kind of ridiculous if we, knowing Donald Trump as we know him. He was in a, a playboy phase, as we all, all know back then in the mid 80s. It was in 87 that he finally met Jeffrey Epstein. They had parties with 28 girls and two guys. And suddenly, during the same period, Trump is presenting himself as this expert on foreign policy that he's so interested in arcane issues like uh, Soviet relationship to Japan that he takes ads out in newspapers. Uh, that, I think, believe, I believe, gives a whole new dimension to, to uh, things like the ad that he took out during that period, which, of course, as Yuri will tell you, um, was really, uh, Yuri was back in Russia in, that, in September of 1987, and uh, he got uh, an internal memo saying that this was really an active measure by a new asset, and it included the ad I just mentioned, which was signed by Donald Trump. So you see that throughout the entire book. Well, so let's go straight to Yuri. I mean, you know, let me let me just start by asking, um, what uh, what is it about Donald Trump that would have been so interesting, so appealing uh, to Russian intelligence back in the 1980s? I mean, after all, he's just a real estate developer in in New York. Yeah. Not at that point, even a particularly high profile one. You know, based in Queens, um, the glamour days were coming a little bit later. I think. So what was it about him that really would have attracted? And then how do we make the link from the hypothetical that he would have been uh, of interest to them to the conclusion that he was and he was recruited? Efforts were made to recruit him. What are the specific signs you see that show that? Well, uh, first, I would like to add some words to the previous question, because I believe it's very important. I am surprised by this opinion that it's just compilation of everything which has been in the public domain. In fact, I haven't seen 
anything in public domain before this book which would show exact connection involvement of the russian intelligence community with trump donald trump they were opinions they were speculations but they haven't been a single fact i haven't seen a single name of a kgb guy or fsb guy i haven't seen any detailed factual account of how it happened so this book basically it is uh a case file professional case file on how it actually happened how donald trump was spotted by the russian by the kgb intelligence how he was cultivated or developed as they say in the kgb and how it all culminated in what we had in 2016 when he was election elected the president so everything which relates to donald trump and his relations with the russian intelligence in this book is new at least for me uh why he drew attention uh we need to remember that it was the time of the cold war it was the last the biggest splash of the cold war and at that time to recruit an american citizen as an agent it was like for a regular pilot to fly to the moon and return back. It was considered almost a mission impossible. And our biggest chief at the time was saying that recruit me any American and we will find a way to use it for our to use him or her for our advantage. Uh, on the other hand, we had I mean, the Soviet Union and the KGB intelligence had had by that time a very good but elderly asset. His name was Armand Hammer, a billionaire which had been used by the KGB and the Kremlin and their asset since the days of the Bolshevik Revolution. He met Vladimir Lenin. He did a lot of good things for the Kremlin, but by the 80s he was in his 90 he was pretty old he needed the kgb needed a replacement so donald trump from this perspective was a very good candidate to replace armand mm -hmm. hammer as our man in the higher level business cycles of the united states which by itself was viewed as important uh, segments of penetration for the KGB intelligence. Uh, third consideration was that he had set, uh, certain characteristics which led KGB to believe that he has a good future. Um, I would remind you that uh, uh, in, in the KGB, in their history, they had a very good case when in the 1930s they recruited in Cambridge a group of students which later became known as Cambridge Five who later in the 40s and 50s became very prominent uh, individuals in the British intelligence service in the British foreign office and provided a wealth of information so the KGB was and is its successors are uh, very patient and they very and they like to work on the so-called perspective agent meaning they recruit a developer today and then several years later you have a president elect and this is exactly what happened um I, I I have another question that comes from a um, a very well known former CIA uh, officer, uh, Milt Bearden, um, with whom I chatted uh, briefly uh, about your book, um, and uh, and his immediate reaction was to say that uh, at some point in the near future there'll be a walk in in a, a CIA. Uh, station somewhere in the world, maybe Mexico or maybe some city in Europe or Africa, 
uh, and a um, a Russian agent uh, seeking to defect and looking for an American passport, maybe a condo in Vail, and a lot of money, uh, will say he has the file uh, that documents this entire relationship, um, and he has a list of demands for it, um, starting with a big cash uh, request. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to ask you to think, you know, it, do you see that as a um, as a possibility in the future? And and if something like that happens, you know, how would a, a CIA station chief have to react to something like that? Is that for me or, or your? Uh, yeah, I think it's for both of you. But maybe yeah. you want to go first, Craig. So all right. Well, well, I think there are parts of it. Yuri's better equipped to answer, but yeah. I I think. Um, uh, you know, one of the most horrifying things about this is there's been no counterintelligence investigation. And I think that's extraordinary. So I think we have to get to the bottom of this or it will happen again. Uh, there's no question that Trump's power has plummeted and he's no longer nearly as important uh, to Russia as he was as a weapon. So it's quite possible that at some point in the future, and I don't know when that would be, uh, that uh, someone might feel free to open it, but I don't think it's in the immediate future. But I, again, I defer to Yuri. Uh, who? But what what do you think yeah. specifically? It's worth to the United States. Why would the U.S. be shelling out millions of dollars now that Trump is a retiree? What's the value? Well, I, I think when you look over what happened with Trump. Uh, Again, it has not been investigated. And if we don't investigate it, it will happen again. And if you read my book, you can go to various points where there are all sorts of things that, that uh, opened the door for what was initially a very banal transaction, buying television sets, that sort of morphed over time, over 40 years, into the biggest, most powerful uh, intelligence operation perhaps in history. So what, how and why did that happen? And you, we have to examine it if we're going to prevent it again. Yuri? Yes, Scott, uh, you ask a very complicated question. There are several questions which may take hours in uh, KGB or SVR. Uh, we I mean, we don't have hours, but- yeah. to, to lecture, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'll, be, I'll, I'll try to be concise first. Uh, yes. I believe there will be individuals on the Russian side who I believe within the next several months, I even said the timeline, would walk in somewhere into the US government institution and offer some intelligence information possibly related to Donald Trump. Why I say so? Because there is a transition of power in Moscow right now from Putin, who is losing it to his potential successors. And unfortunately, potential successors are the FSB led by Nikolai Patrushev. These guys are terrorists, actually. These are the same guys who blew up buildings in Moscow in 99 to bring Putin to power. Uh, they were the ones who poisoned Litvinenko in London, then Skripal's family in, uh, in uh, Salisbury, who recently poisoned Navalny in Russia. So these are monsters. But as the history shows us, succession of power in Moscow usually leads to leakage of sensitive intelligence information because different factions they need to get in touch with appropriate agencies of the US government for different reasons. And for this, they offer information. So I expect that within, and I'm getting actually signals, which I treat as reliable as serious, that within the uh, few months, uh, the offer for intelligence information will be coming. Second aspect of this question is this. Um, Mr. Burden suggests that it may be a good idea just to sit tight at the embassy and wait for a, what we call walk-in or volunteer who recruits himself 
and then comes as a gift to the embassy, like Aldrich Ames came to the Soviet embassy and says, guys, I'm yours. I need money. I have secrets. Let's, let's walk, you know. I call these walk-ins a miracle because it's not a product of work of the station, intelligence station. Miracle can happen tomorrow or it can happen 25 years from now. And if we sit and wait for the miracle to happen, we'll definitely have another 9-11 and we may have an onslaught and non-stop penetration of hostile intelligence services into the United States. So I believe another strategy is much better, proactive strategy. So we better get out of the embassy, go into the street, we look for information, we recruit agents, we got tidbit, tidbit of information, then connect the dots. And this way we can in advance understand what the bad guys are preparing for us. Uh, so I would, in brief, I would answer this way. Yeah. So, so Craig and Yuri have more or less the same response here, which is that we shouldn't sit back and wait for it, but we should be going after to unravel everything and complete a counterintelligence uh, investigation. Um, well, it, it seems to me that um, whenever anyone uh, unravels or exposes a major um, intelligence operation, the pushback, and this is probably true just about anywhere in the world and with any intelligence operation, the pushback is pretty much always uh, to point a finger at the people who are doing the exposing and accuse them of being tin-hatted lunatics, conspiracy theorists. So, so I'll just put that on the table for you. So, uh, you know, this is, um, this is conspiracy theory squared. So it's not only all of this, you know, uh, Russian Manchurian candidate stuff uh, that uh, Attorney General Barr told us had been totally debunked and Trump himself has thousands of times said it's debunked. It's not true. It's crazy. Uh, it's also we've also folded in Opus Dei, you know, another uh, another uh, sort of conspiracy theory that um, that's propelled uh, Hollywood to any number of feature motion pictures. Uh, but, you know, there's very, very little about it that can actually be documented. So, you know, so how do you respond to that? So, Craig, you're up first. OK, well, well, I think if you look at all the con I mean, there's a lot of talk of conspiracy theorists and all that. And I, I think everything is a mirror image of what it's crit criticizing. So, in, in fact, you, you do have, if you look at the Epstein scandal, the Jeffrey Epstein scandal, you do have pedophiles. You do have horrifying pedophilia and sex traffic and all that. But it's reflected uh, when you see people like Marjorie uh, uh, Taylor Greene uh, and various other right wing uh, nuts, I think, saying that they're satanic pedophiles in the basement of the Comet Pizza place in Washington. Uh, you, you see that kind of thing going on and on uh, uh, from the right. Uh, the conspiracies that really took place, the corruption is mind boggling beyond belief. Uh, you, you look at the Leon Black case uh, where he paid $158 million. This is according to the New York Times uh, to Jeffrey Epstein. And for what? Uh, for tax advice? I don't think so. Um, you know, there had to be compromise in that at, at, in one way or another. And I think that's an element you see running through all this, that you see, you do see compromise of factories. These are, compromise, of course, is compromising material, and it's a bit like extortion or blackmail. It's being held over people. So there's a lot of that going on. And when you, you investigate the whole uh, spectrum, it is sort of remarkable. I mean, when I was talking... Uh, to Yuri, he identified Trump as a, 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 a special unofficial contact. And when you look at other people who've held that, that kind of, been in that kind of category, it's not just Armand Hammer, it's people like Robert Maxwell, who is Glenn Maxwell's father. Um, and so there, there's an awful lot going on in a very, very dark world. There are trillions and trillions of dollars in dark money. Uh, that that are being laundered and put back in our economy, much of it from Russia, from uh, from the Middle East as well, and China. Um, 
so it's a, it's a period of just extraordinary corruption and you know conspiracies is really i think i mean you're the lawyer but it's more than one person committing a crime really and, and working together and that does happen um that's exactly right and of course you know we we uh, some conspiracies in fact occur regularly they get regularly charged in in criminal cases um the problem here is uh is the issue of proof uh that of course a um uh, a professionally managed uh, active measures campaign involves lots of people who have been trained professionally for years to avoid leaving a trail with the sort of evidence that can be used for legal levels of proof. Yuri, am I right? Yeah, absolutely. The first requirement, requirement of any intelligence operation is confidentiality or conspiracy. Conspiracia. This is how they call it in in in, in Russia. So this is the biggest requirement: not to leave any traces. And until recently, until Putin, they had been pretty good at this. So if you sit and wait until bullet uh, bulletproof evidence, which you can take to the court, you lose this game. You need to 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 look for tidbits of information you can get. And then you have to analyze it. And it's, by the way, I can tell you the analysis, analysis of case file of information. When I was trained in this uh, intelligence academy, uh, we were trained 24 uh, seven, basically. Um, there we lived in the outskirts in the woods of Moscow. And we had most of the time for, uh, for, for training in foreign languages. Uh, after the foreign language, the most time was spent on uh, analysis. We had a crowd in our group, for instance, about 18 guys, and most of them could perfectly make a dead drop, low dead drop, unload dead drop, detect surveillance, uh, avoid surveillance, but just two guys had excellence on analysis. So it's a hard, real job, but you should know this uh, in order to do the analysis. Now, just a few words uh, about uh, conspiracy theories with respect to this book. Um, what I, what we did on Trump KGB connection with uh, Craig, it's not an article, it's not a religious text which you believe or you don't believe. Uh, I produced a professional case analysis of a case file. Craig presented this in a language which would be interesting to read for readers, uh, not in bureaucratic language. It was originally written by me. Uh, so it requires to know each intelligence agency had its own modus operandi. And analysis, this particular analysis, is based on inside knowledge of this modus operandi because I was there at that time. I was involved in a parallel operation of basically identical. So it requires a certain knowledge of professional detail. And I'm ready to sit down with any professional in this field, intelligence, counter intelligence service uh, officer, and to go paragraph by paragraph, sentence by sentence of the story of Trump KGB relations and try to disapprove me. Not just say I don't believe it. Tell me where. <laughs> Tell me what you don't believe. And I will explain. Well, let's go, let's just let's start by uh, assuming it's right uh, that that you've um, you've exposed an operation, an active measures operation that was maintained for a period of about 40 years or a little less than 40 years, perhaps, um, uh, with an individual who uh, becomes politically prominent uh, and rises ultimately to be president of the United States. Um, and then you continue to exercise at least some measure of influence over him uh, during his presidency and thereafter, things going on afterwards. Um, so I put it to you that this is the most successful Russian intelligence operation of all time. Is that right? Uh, I, I Well, I'm not an expert on Russia, but I think the, the flip side of it is that it's the most serious national security failure 
uh, perhaps since the Civil War in the United States, since John Wilkes Booth. You're you're the you're the intel the Russian intelligence professional. Yes. From Anything you can think of that's better than this? Uh, it is the big, biggest success in history, but there is a caveat because it wasn't the result of a well-planned operation they had been conducted for 40 years. They were just working the guy, working the operation. And then the stars, the stars angled in a special way and it just happened. So it happened sometimes. It was a fluke, just a streak of good luck for them. Uh, I believe that they realized that this candidate, Donald Trump, has a reasonable chance to be to become the next president of the United States somewhere at the end of March or early April 2016. Before that, no one in Moscow had any hopes. Uh, in, 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 this department. And when they realized, they threw the entire capability, everything they had to help him, they introduced into the operation the agents which had been operational in the United States in the early 70s. Serious, very good, uh, camouflaged people. Uh, and unfortunately, unfortunately for them, for the Russians, when they uh, started working on this uh, in full gear, this is where they expose themselves. By the way, it is interesting, maybe it would be interesting to listeners to know that the whole Russian meddling into 2016 uh, presidential campaign in the United States, it was from the KGB point of view, a sham, sham madness. I remember when I just joined the department number one, which was American department, uh, my first boss who had in total about eight years uh, of posting in the United States, very experienced gentleman. He told me that, you know what, we have capability to intervene and to influence to some extent presidential elections in the United States. But we're not, go we're, not, we're not going to do that because if you do this kind of preparation, it should be absolutely confidential, which is very hard. No one would watch that it would be absolutely confidential. But if we fail and Americans will notice that we are involved, the negative ramification of this failure will be just horrendous for our country. And this is exactly what happened for Kremlin after Donald Trump was elected the president, but the exposure of his connection with Russia just put them in a corner and he couldn't help Russia to the extent they, they, they expected this to happen. Well, um, so let's, let's switch to, a, to a, a, a different subject. So it, it seems to me, you know, reading over this book as a whole, um, it's a tapestry um, and there, um, there are many different um, yarns that flow through it. So, you know, certainly the principal one is um, Russian intelligence, the Russian intelligence uh, recruitment operation and the active measures. Um, another is, which I was rather surprising to me, is Opus Dei, figuring in a very, very prominent way. Uh, another is Bill Barr and all the Kirkland and Ellis uh, uh, lawyers who seem to heavily populate uh, this um, uh, past uh, presidency, the Trump presidency. And another is Jeffrey Epstein and all of his doings um, in which you offer um, uh, analysis that I think many, many uh, people before have hinted at. But you, uh, I think, go quite a bit further in suggesting the linkage between these activities and those of um uh, of intelligence services, but let, let's just step back to you know these main two strands of Opus Dei and Russian intelligence. So why would Opus Dei not expose a Russian intelligence operation if they knew about it, if they'd learned about it? Why would they allow it to go forward uh, unexposed? Uh, that's um, I think puzzling uh, to most people who look at it. 
Well, I, I think the most obvious answer is power. Uh, Opus Dei is an exceedingly <laughs> weird and mysterious group, and it go, its roots go back to fascist Spain, and it's very authoritarian in nature. Uh, I kept trying to find, uh, you know, exact, I, were there links between Opus Dei and Russia? And no, I couldn't find a single one. What I could find is that they uh, attached themselves to uh, William Barr uh, very early on. He was uh, uh, on the board of directors of the Catholic Information Center, which is the operational headquarters of Opus Dei in Washington. He says he's not in Opus Dei. They say he's not in Opus Dei. But the truth is it's a secret society, and the nature of a secret society is it's secret. So you really don't know. And they do lie at times, and they have a doctrine of, um, uh, forgive me, the where they can rationalize almost anything to the point of lying. Um, and you see this small group of people, the, even the board of the Catholic Information Center uh, was centered near the FBI. Uh, Robert Hansen was in uh, the, the great, the, the spy, Russian spy uh, who, who worked in, who was with the FBI was in Opus Dei. His brother-in-law happened to be the chief speechwriter for William Barr when he was attorney general the first time around under President George H.W. Bush. And you see them also allied with members of the uh, Federalist Society, which, of course, is this uh, large, much larger, uh, deeply conservative group. Uh, one of the key people there is Leonard Leo, and uh, who, who has uh, vetted, I believe, the last six Republican Supreme Court justices. So they have enormous clout there, and they want... Uh, they want those judges. They they want to wipe out Roe v. Wade. Uh, it's an you know, and they've essentially taken enormous power throughout the judiciary. It also happens to overlap, oddly enough, with as you say, law firms like uh, Kirkland and Ellis, a, an immensely rich uh, law firm, which happens to represent a lot of roach and oligarchs, and there's big money coming in from them, uh, and they end up in a lot of those attorneys ended up in Bill Barr's uh, Justice Department. So there was this great accumulation of power. And uh, I think there is sort of a shared ideology between the theology of Opus Dei, which is very, very authoritarian, and the kind of imperial presidency that uh, uh, William Barr advocated and used to enable Donald Trump to become almost dictatorial. And, and that's sort of the direction I see things going in. So, so, Yuri, let me flip it around a little bit for you, I mean, and, and ask, you know, how would Russian intelligence view a group like Opus Dei? I mean, Russian intelligence, of course, has well-documented relations with the Russian Orthodox Church. That's been sort of a, a key part of operations for a very long period of time. On the other hand, you know, it's had quite a bit of hostility towards many other uh, religious groups and the Catholic Church in particular, I think, has been suspect and the subject of repression. Um, and the certainly in the communist period, that was that was the case. So, how do you understand this relationship uh, between FSB, the the Foreign Service, KGB, and Opus Dei? Uh, well, actually, I don't. I don't. <laughs> this is this is attitude great. rather than this relationship. I should say. I covered, which is even. <laughs> So, which which was uh, surprising for me, but I can explain something here. Uh, it was especially evident under Putin, under his administration. People in Moscow and the Kremlin they're prone to conspiracy theories. They like everything secretly, and they believe in theories which are close to what QAnon is distributing. They believe that there is some kind of cabal somewhere out there, uh, a group of powerful people which, with, who pull, pull the string and make the world work at work. And they're plotting against Russia. They want to destroy Mother Russia. Uh, and sometimes they generate this series. And then they start believing because this series goes through mass media, etc. Give you an ex one example. And in Yeltsin's administration in Kremlin, there was a guy, he was two-star FSB general. His name was Rogozin. Uh, he was involved in some kind of 
parapsychology. And he generated an idea that America wants to take over Siberia because of envy that there are so many natural resources there. Uh, he was a question, how did you know that? He said that, you know, Madeleine Albright, the Secretary of State of the United States at the time, we penetrated into her mind. And what we saw there in her mind was hatred towards Russia and the desire to take over Siberia. This is what these crazy guys really believe. And you know what? Right now, in you can you can very often run onto this uh, story in the Russian social media uh, networks. There is no reference to Rogozin anymore. This story lives by itself. This is a fact already that Madeleine Albright wanted to take over Siberia. You know? So this explains why they're interested in different in everything that seems or is secret and has this cloud of you know exclusivity so uh, i can explain just by, by this but during the time of the kgb this series was just off the wall we had strict so-called objective or principle of penetration based on uh, objects object meaning uh government institutions pentagon white house uh cia FBI, etc these are the main objects and then intermediary objects such as think tanks law firms lobbying firms etc but they were no opus dei or some biddleberg club which you know which which they are very uh, concerned with right now in russia in in moscow yeah well i i think we've got just a few minutes left so i think the, the last subject i've got to toss out to you has got to be jeffrey epstein right we haven't quite gotten to any discussion of him um, although he winds up being almost in the exact center of, of the book um, and some of the really most remarkable chapters. So what are the ties here between Epstein and professional intelligence services, Russian intelligence, and Trump? Uh, you know, what, what unites all these things? How are they tied together? Well, to me, what I saw in Epstein, you know, most people write about him as running a, a sex trafficking ring, which, of course, is true. But it was also a compromise factory. And I looked for his uh, links to various intelligence sources. And uh, uh, I had one Israeli uh, agent tell me he saw uh, uh, Epstein with Robert Maxwell in London in Maxwell's office. And Maxwell himself is Ghislaine Maxwell's father, the, uh, the great British press baron who, who had enormous intelligence ties. He was very close to General Khrushchev, who was head of the KGB. Uh, so there, there are certainly questions about that, and you see it throughout the whole Epstein operation. Um, I interviewed, among other people, uh, a man named John Mark Dugan, who was a deputy sheriff in Palm Beach County, while Epstein was being investigated. And I tracked him down in Moscow. Uh, John Mark Dugan, to me, reminded me of a guy from a refugee from an Elmore Leonard uh, novel. And uh, he had uh, been given, he told me, 478 files, of, uh, 478 DVDs of apparent sexual activities because Epstein had cameras in all these rooms in his various residences where he was um, uh, taping uh, people, you know, the, he was collecting the dirty little secrets of the richest and most powerful people in the world. But well, what does this have to do with Trump? That's 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 the uh, the part we haven't yet crossed. Well, Epstein and Trump were good good friends for fifteen years, um, and it started around nineteen eighty seven. That friendship, uh, it their friendship blew up uh, in the early two thousands, and it was a, over this famous Palm Beach mansion that Epstein very much wanted to buy, and that uh, uh, Donald Trump after consulting with it, scooped it out from under his nose and then flipped it. He sold it for double the price to the Russian oligarch uh, Rublovlev. Um, so that ended their friendship. And uh, not long afterwards, Epstein was showing around photos of Donald Trump with a, a couple of uh, young women or girls. I don't know their age. Uh, but they what, What's your specific evidence for that? Uh, yeah, I talked, this was a, a off the record, a, a background source who said he saw it. 
Uh, it's, it, it's not fully conclusive, but, but you could see uh, Trump turned on Epstein very, very much after this period. So, Yuri, um, why would this be of interest to, to Moscow, to Russian intelligence? Oh, um, well, this story deserves a separate book <laughs> written by, by Craig. Because what we have here is two unprecedented since World War II events. First, honey trap. The KGB used honey traps, but mostly domestically. They never, well, on very rare occasions, they used it uh, outside of the Soviet Union. By honey trap, they, they, uh, they meant uh, beautiful ladies, which seduced uh, high level officials, generals, uh, scientists, etc. Now, uh, they use it massively in Western Europe and in the United States. And they use it in the biggest after the end of a World War II operation, Russian intelligence operation. In the years of last years of World, of World War II, the Russians were stealing a bomb in the United States. Now they're after artificial intelligence and so-called supercomputer. Uh, there is obsession in the Kremlin that who is the first to get the supercomputer and artificial intelligence will run the world. And this is where this operation comes, comes in. Uh, it is massive. It involves hundreds, if not thousands, of people, Russian agents operating in this country. And what Craig describes is just a tiny bit, tiny example of this. So, so now we're going to turn the floor back over to Sabir to moderate a Q&A session. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt that uh, fascinating conversation, but I think we have a good question to pivot off of Yuri's answer to start with, which is from James, who asks, is the Trump case unique? Have there been any similar FSU slash SU deep penetration of politics or corporations operations in any other key Western countries since 1980? Uh, well, if this is a question for me, uh, I've been working on the United States and my focus was always on, on the United States. Uh, my knowledge about Russian penetration in Western Europe is, is professional, but it's pretty much peripheral. Uh, I've been doing business security investigations, which led, brought me some information showing that the Russians uh, over the last about 10 years have unprecedented penetration into the U UK in political and business circles of the UK. They have business, uh, they have big success in it penetrating in Germany and in France. But I would just uh, like to add something. I mean, I, I would add the entire Republican Party, if you look at it. I mean, it, it, and it happens in many different ways, uh, many of which happen to be legal. That is, uh, you know, if, if a new coal mine appears in Kentucky and it's tied to Oleg Deripaska, well, he, he of course, is an oligarch who is very, very close to Vladimir Putin. And that's why uh, Mitch McConnell is sometimes called Moscow Mitch. And if you look at uh, some of the campaign contributions, uh, the Republican Senatorial Campaign uh, Committee gets lots of money from Lenin Blavatnik, who's a naturalized American, uh, so it's perfectly legal, but he's also a Russian oligarch. And uh, uh, I've written about this in two books, and, and it's just incredibly widespread now uh, throughout the Republican Party. And I think that's why we see a lot of the craziness uh, as to what it's become. It's very much like the party of regions in Ukraine, which is essentially a political party for Vladimir Putin. Um, that actually helped answer a few other questions which revolved around the Republican Party's represent, rep, well, excuse me, the Republican Party's relationship with the Russian compromise. Right. I mean, it's astonishing to me. I, I grew up in Dallas and the Republican, you could not be more right wing and anti-communist 
than uh, the, the people I grew up with. And to see the same political party uh, turning a blind eye to all this is just extraordinary. And our next question is someone playing devil's advocate who asks, how has Russia directly benefited from having Trump as an agent if it didn't, if it did so? Isn't it actually much worse off? Its economy is stagnant, tech base is declining, capital flight has soared. We are seeing massive protests. Putin is widely reviled, NATO is reviving, and sanctions are spreading across the world. Right. Well, I mean, if you look, do you want to go, go ahead? No, no, I will, I will, I will pick it up. Yeah, I mean, if you look at all the favors uh, Trump has done for the Republicans, it's just enormous. And uh, Putin wanted to put, uh, was constantly saying American democracy is corrupt. Well, now at least 70 million Trump supporters absolutely believe that, and they believe the presidential election was stolen. And I think, relatively speaking, the United States is much weaker. That may not address uh, all the questions uh, your, your, uh, uh, the uh, other person raised, but uh, the damage to the West has been absolutely enormous, and it's going to take us quite a while to recover. Um. The problem with this operation is that the Russians, the Putin's secret services, they blew it. As I explained earlier to previous questions, when they started massively uh, helping uh, Trump to be to become re elected, they exposed his connections with Moscow, and they basically, by doing so, they put him in the corner. They, everybody started talking that he's connected to Russia, this is Putin puppet, and he could not do in this situation, he could not do as much as he could have been done if it was secret, you know. So Russians exposed him and neutralized his capability to help, uh, to help them more efficiently. But he did help, he helped a lot. What he did, uh, he put on hold many of uh, initiatives. Uh, basically, most of them were initiated by the U.S. House. Uh, the laws about different sanctions imposed on Russia on different uh, over the previous four years, most of them were put on hold or made less effective than they could could have been. So. I mean, the Putin finally, he got the result of his failure by exposing Trump. But on the other hand, there was something, something which uh, helped Russians to make these sanctions less painful and uh, less damaging to the Russian economy. Because, you know, the analysts in Russia, they say that if all sanctions which are embedded into law, past laws passed, over the last four years, had all of them been implemented, Russian economy would have been dead by now. I just add a couple of things here too. I mean, it seems to me that there are two areas where Trump made a huge difference for Russia um, that were advantageous to Russia, not at all advantageous to the United States. The first of them is oil and gas. So uh, Trump reversed course on a series of policies aiming at energy diversification in order to double down on fossil fuels. Um, and that's not remotely beneficial to the United States. I mean, maybe West Virginia a little bit, but that's hugely beneficial to Russia uh, because the Russian economy really is a fossil fuels economy. They needed those exports. That's, that's the key uh, to their economic development because Putin failed to do diversification. And the second thing is NATO. So Trump from, from the 80s, doing as much damage to NATO as possible was always a high priority uh, for Russia and Russian intelligence. Uh, that's the, this uh, newspaper ad that, um, uh, that Craig mentioned uh, and Yuri talked about uh, before that was all targeting NATO and NATO operations. And Trump, from the instant he came in, was doing everything he could possibly do alone to undermine the sound governance and coordination of strategy that are the principal purposes of NATO. He weakened it. So those are just two things. Yeah, and the Russian reactions when he was elected the president, it was evident. It was 
the session of the Russian Duma, Russian parliament, was interrupted when one deputy, he was beaming with joy and pride, announced, ladies and gentlemen, Donald Trump is elected the president of the United States. Right now he's addressing the nation and it was standing ovation. It was like they won the war. A couple of days later, one deputy shows up. It was on YouTube. He is raising the toast, saying that America is ours without a single shot. This is what it means, aggressive and professional foreign policy of President Putin. And this message was spread by the Kremlin's propaganda over entire Russian population. And the idea that our guy recruited and, and is the handler of this guy who was who was always the big guy you know right and now our guy is the master and this one is center it supported putin putin's popularity you know it was it was a real big achievement for his for his pride and he even for his popularity in the population you know and i think all of this is a war of sorts and it's a war with a new kind of war without bombs or bullets or boots on the ground, but it's cyber warfare, it's a war on truth, it's a war of using corruption as weapons, it's a war of looking at all the loopholes in the American system, whether it's campaign finance, corruption through campaign financing, uh, through big, rich, uh, white shoe lawyers, uh, and all sorts of things. And no, I mean, that's why I, I keep saying it's so important to have a, a real counterintelligence investigation to get to the bottom of how all this happened. So unfortunately, we only have time for one more question. And to make things easy, I'm gonna ask a meaty one to end up, which essentially uh, reads, how do we understand the communication between Russia, the Kremlin and Trump is it a matter of ideological alignment or is there a consistent thread of communication through secondary figures within Trump's orbit? Well, I don't think we have all the answers to this. And, and when it gets to the subject of compromise, I think one thing is, is pretty clear is if you look at all the conversations between uh, Trump and Putin, the Russians have them and we don't. And, and we really need that. And that's one thing they can hold over him. Um, I, I don't think there needs to be a constant back and forth. And then in a lot of ways, the way this materialized was sort of a, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, a trading of favors back and forth. Um, uh, and, and you can see what Trump got out of it uh, very early on when, I mean, if you go back to 1984, he had begun effectively allowing Trump real estate to launder money, millions and millions of dollars uh, for the Russian mafia, and uh, I found 13 uh, Russians who were either mobsters or had uh, intelligence ties, either owning or living in Trump Tower and, and Trump properties. That's a lot of uh, mobsters, I think. Um, but if there were other secret communications, well, if they're secret, I don't know all the secrets. I, I agree. I mean, it seems it seems to me that you know what we don't know is is quite alarming. Uh, you know, remember the very first days of the administration when Trump came in, there was a lot of talk that we learned about later about establishing a back channel of communication, not using White House secure comms and things of that sort uh, to allow to facilitate this sort of communication. You know, what the hell is all that about and what communications actually occurred? You know, we still don't know many details. Um, and I guess I've talked to people um, on the um, uh, national security staff uh, in the Trump administration who have told me repeatedly that, you know, one thing that really alarmed them was that they would discover that uh, Trump had communications with Putin directly, and it wasn't a scheduled call. It was nothing they knew about. And people in the White House learned about these calls when they appeared on a readout from the Kremlin, um, which is pretty bizarre. Um, so this was going on all the time, sort of violation of all the protocols. And that, that's not even getting into you know meetings at the G7 
uh, where uh, where uh, Trump walked over to Putin's table uh, and sat down and, and had a conversation with him without even his own translator. So Putin's translator did the translation. I mean, I challenge you to show me any other case where an American president did things like this. I mean, there are good reasons why they wouldn't. Uh, so there are loads of unanswered questions on this comms issue, I think. Yeah, I'll give another example that happened just before uh, Trump was elected in October of 2016. Donald Trump Jr. gave a speech in Paris at a French think tank. Uh, and and uh, it happened, you know, he was paid $50,000 plus. All that's perfectly legal, of course. What was unusual is the French think tank is widely said to be uh, a front for Russian intelligence. And he was passed uh, talking point. Donald Trump Jr. was passed talking points on uh, what policy the Russians wanted Trump to carry out in the Middle East once he, he got, uh, got into office. And sure enough, Trump did exactly what they wanted when he pulled troops out of Syria, abandoned our Kurdish allies, and left the Russians in charge of it. Now, all of that was perfectly legal. Every little step of it was legal, but it was part of a larger intelligence operation. No. Um, actually, um, he was not, Donald Trump was not micromanaged. He was micromanaged. And he got the assignment after, uh, during his first trip to Moscow, 1987. And actually, he published this assignment in three major American newspapers upon his return from Moscow. He published his view on world affairs in Washington Post, New York Times, Boston Globe. And the idea was we need to uh, unravel, we need to uh, break all our national security agreements with our traditional allies uh, to hell with NATO. We'll get together with Russia and we too will run, will rule the world. So it's bipolar world. This is what Russia has been looking for for decades. And that's what he's been doing. When specific questions arises, obviously he was not doing this for for for, for an idea, for ideology. I believe it was first his ego, his vanity, and, uh, and money, and money. Uh, when the necessary necessity arise for specific uh, uh, issues to solve. He had a line of communication. I'll, I, I will outline you just once. He has Rudy Giuliani. He can tell what he needs to know to Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani goes to Kiev where he communicates with two higher level Russian intelligence, intelligence agents. He tells them what is required, what the boss wants. These guys, they take private jets, they fly to Moscow, and they communicate this to the FSB, or to Putin, and then it goes backwards channel. They have a channel of communication. And then uh, openness. Openness in intelligence sometimes is the best cover for uh, intelligence espionage activities. And this is exactly what Scott described just now when they communicated uh, in unusual circumstances, breaking all possible protocols which existed. Uh. Well, on that note, I want to thank all three of you, Craig, Yuri, and Scott, for a disturbing but like interesting conversation. Uh, on that note, to our audience, thank you so much for joining us this evening. If you have yet to purchase a copy of American Compromat, there is a helpful green button which says purchase in the center of your screen you can click on. And uh, to everyone, thank you and good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Yep. Thank you and good night. Thank you.